Bom dia. Agradecemos a presença de todos. Good morning. We would like to thank everyone's participation for being here today to participation at this uh, colloquium, which will address intersections in a responsible AI. AI. I will now give the floor to my colleague who will introduce our speakers, Daniele Ferraro. She is from this uh, university. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. We are going to start our colloquium with the Saida Nash Carter. She is a native uh, business, uh, digital, digital business, and she's got several initiatives in the global scenario. She started her career building up multimedia for Yahoo, AWOL, and Google. She is a co-founder of Thompson Riders Black Employees Network with a group of friends and she organized the first Reuters newsmaker about Africa when everyone in the financial services in New York would talk about Africa. In 2015, she acted as a black employee networking and she organized one of the first talks about race in the cooperative America. Before I give the floor to Saida, let me remind you that those of you who'd like to submit your questions, please send them by email. Maybe if they could write down the email in the chat, that could be a good idea for those who couldn't get the address. Saida, you have the floor now. Now I'll switch to Portuguese. Okay. Wonderful, thank you for the introduction and good morning to everyone. Um, as was mentioned, I pretty much spent 20 years building data products for one of the world's largest global um, data companies, Thomson Reuters. And so uh, my orientation to, um, to this work really comes from a product development uh, perspective. So we can bring up the first slide. Yes. So um, again, Saida Nash Carter, I'm going to be speaking about um, sort of under this umbrella of uh, man and machine as partners in repair. Move on to the next slide. And that's a pretty provocative um, title. But what it really means is how might we build purpose-driven intelligence and um, super tools that encourage and help us to develop a more regenerative um, and life-affirming futures. Next slide. So um, one of the things that I think most people do these days is to ask ChatGPT um, sort of some of these, uh, some questions, right? My daughter calls ChatGPT Chad. Um, and I ask ChatGPT uh, what man and machine partners and repair would mean to him or, or it, depending upon how I'm feeling in a day. Um, and it was pretty spectacular, the answers that, um, that came back. I mean, as you can see here, um, <clears throat> the future, um, as defined at least by the, the, the GPT that I interact with, um, sees a partnership as um, pretty positive in future. And um, it involves renewable resources and the earth thriving because of a partnership between humans um, and, uh, and robots. There's inclusive innovation where um, society is flourishing um, in this future that is shaped by human invention and empathetic AI partners. Um, education is more personalized 
because AI is able to adapt to each individual learner's um, needs and um, strengths and um, areas for development. Um, we're even in exploring space together in a responsible way um, and, and thinking about how to continue to inspire generations for future um, responsible space exploration. So this is what um, my version of GPT was able to, to conjure up um, when I asked that question about man and machine being partners in repair. Can we move to the next slide? And so then when I think about that, I think about um, how whenever I talk to most humans about what AI means for the future or what machine learning means for the future, and um, it's far more dystopian. And it, it makes me think, you know, is our polycrisis state, because I think we can all agree that we are um, as humanity right now, dealing with multiple crises as, at once, from uh, genocide to um, uh, an environment that's that is um, imploding around us, etc. But is that polycrisis state uh, causing a crisis of um, imagination for humanity? Next slide. And so my work at Thomson Reuters and my work in data um, product development was largely in the innovation space. And one of the things we always asked in, asked in our uh, innovation work in order to think differently is this very simple question, what if? And so I asked, what if, next slide, AI was humanity-centered? What if it was Earth-centered? And what even if it was uh, Ubuntu-centered? Next slide. And I, for this audience, maybe I will define Ubuntu quickly. It may not be a familiar term, but it is a um, it's a, a Southern African uh, term that essentially means. Um, common humanity and, and interconnectedness with nature and with the cosmos. So we can move to the next slide. So how might we get there? Next slide. It all begins with data, right? Um, and you can tap the full, move that forward. Data essentially is, um, it's content, it's all kinds of content. Um, and it's what is the absolute essence of, um, of all machine, learning algorithms. If you tap the slide one more time, then it will advance to the um, next points there. There we go. And then we can move on to the next slide again. So what is data? It is raw facts, it's information, it's content um, and financial services. We often think about it as, as numbers, um, rows and columns, but it's also text, images, audio, and more. There's information all around us. Um, but importantly, it's our narratives and it's our stories. Next slide. So I think this is a, a, a group that's pretty familiar with how um, machine learning works, but I'll go through the quick a quick reflow here. So data essentially becomes training data that then um, trains the machines. And so the human magic sort of happens in that transformation of the data into training data. And then that thing gets fed to the machine. So what actually is in that training data is, is, is critical. And what comes out of the other end is all of those um, personalized AI, AI powered solutions that um, help us to um, see the movies one we want to watch that where Siri can recognize our voices. Um, we can prevent bank fraud, etc. Next slide. And so it follows, we talk about this all the time in data science, if you put garbage into the system, you get garbage out, right? If you put bias into the system, you get bias out. If you put equity into the into the, the the machines, then you will get equity out. If you put Ubuntu in, you might actually also get Ubuntu out. Next slide. So this idea of data Africanism um, that began to begun to explore came to me um, 
uh, on the back of this book that was written and published at the end of last year, Data Feminism. And it really sort of poses these questions. Um, data science, um, by whom, for whom, and with whose interests in mind. Um, next slide. I think I may have, I don't know if you guys can still see my presentation. Yes. Um, okay. If so, then that's fine. I can't see it on my side anymore, but if you guys can see it, then I'll, I'll carry on in the interest of time. Okay, so um, I'm now on the slide with um, the inner development goals. So as we're thinking about what data Africanism can mean, um, <clears throat> this concept of um, Ubuntu and even Utu, which is a similar concept more from East Africa, this idea sort of shows up multiple places across the African continent. And in my global work, I also realize the intersections with those ideas with some work that's coming out of the global north um, called the inner development goals, which is essentially um, this idea of how humans must be in the world, how we must interact and how we must um, uh, work together really in order to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And when I learned about these these this approach, it immediately um, made me think about Ubuntu and Utu and all of what um, uh, those ideas mean across the continent. And so there's a lot of richness in that that can be leveraged um, to help us achieve the sustainable development goals. And then on to the next slide, there's also significant conversations now happening in the global north and elsewhere globally, really, um, around new economic models, right? Um, so if you go to the next slide, there's um, a, a new documentary that was just launched and released called um, Outgrow the System. And it essentially talks about new ways of um, running an economy. It talks about um, new ways of doing business, whether it's circular economy, um, economy for the common good, community wealth building. And as I think about those ideas now sort of emanating from the North and from the West, I'm reminded of all of those mechanisms that are already in place in many of the African and even African-American communities that I know, whether it's um, Ujima and Ujima, which is cooperative economics, um, or Stockvilles and Susus, um, these are ways of being that um, are, are, are very um, innate and common in many African communities that can be um, tapped into as we think about how we might build the future and how we might train machines for the future. Um, we can move on to the next slide. And then one more. Yeah, okay. And so when I, again, going back to this conversation that I've kind of always have going on now with the, the, the GPTs in my life, um, I ask the question specifically, well, what does data Africanism mean to you? And this was the definition that came back. And it's the movement and philosophy around the use, ownership, and interpretation of data in Africa or about Africans. It emphasizes the importance of African voices and contexts. It advocates for African knowledge systems, cultural values, and socioeconomic equity. So equity, I have bolded because I actually changed that word. Um, it was, I think it was realities was what came back in the, in the response, but I think it's important to put equity in there. And socioeconomic equity and data-driven processes aiming to address issues of representation and empowerment. So that's the definition that, um, that, J that ChatGPT was able to come up with. So the next slide. Um, thankfully, there are many amazing organizations that are working sort of in this area in general, not so much on data Africanism specifically, but certainly connected to it in terms of the kinds of work that 
um, they're doing, whether it's um, African languages um, or um, other ways of pulling together sets of content that are um, reflective of, of the values that we need to um, bake into the technology of the future. And that's it. Also, oh, next slide. Sorry, I have. It's kind of a bit of a funny one, but um, you know, going back to this original idea of being in a poly crisis state, and um, you know, this this sometimes getting caught up with what might be a very dystopian future. We are absolutely um, at times greedy, violent, and stupid, but we're also loving, creative, and divine. And the future is what we make it. Thank you. Thank you, Saida. Any questions to Saida? Yes, we have a question. Uh, thank you, Saida. Um, I, from what I, I hear you when you were when you showed like the the chat GPT, chat GPT answers and then uh, which is a kind of utopic uh, perspective um, like more global north uh, you know rom rom romanticization uh, of uh, the um, the the technologies uh, but then you were talking about how to make data be representative of other way of thinking and other so i would like to know uh, about the project you have asked on elder because this is what i read in your profile and i think it's a kind of um, practical action to make this happen. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, you're right, this presentation is more of a sort of thought spark or a provocation just to get us thinking differently. But for, as a practical matter, um, I absolutely believe that um, and know that stories our data and um, ensuring that we are collecting um, our stories and um, uh, tracking them and um, organizing them in ways that can be meaningful and instructive is, is critical, um, especially as we think about the development of future technologies. So Ask an Elder is a, um, a crowdsourced, um, sort of open uh, story sharing initiative that is um, the, where the intention is to uh, pull in and collect stories that are um, representative of these values that we care about in our communities and the ways of our ways of being. Um, and to preserve, frankly, some of our histories and stories that may not otherwise um, be captured and um, and um, uh, held on to um, for future generations. So, it, yeah, so that is that's what Ask an Elder is. It's social media based. Um, anyone can participate. There are. Um, stories or insights or wisdom to share in key areas and a lot of the information is on our social media pages then um, then please do it's in the the sort of early stages of development so it's like a beta project if you will now but it's also something that um, we're wanting to be very grassroots so in communities through communities by communities just gaining um, uh, momentum to gather and share more stories uh, yeah, for our use in this way. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Saida. I'll ask the questions. Any other question? Shall we switch to Ellen now? 
Thank you, Saida, for now. No problem. Thank you. É a próxima fala da Helena. Our next speaker is Helena. She's a postdoc at Oscar Sala Chair. She represents the advanced studies by the USP Universe. She is a master in design and a social scientist. She coordinates the study of responsible A. AI and the group Decolonize AI. She's got a degree in music and several artistic creative attempts. She's got a degree in the University of California, the Department of Philosophy in Moynash University. She's an author of the books, uh, Electronic Art, Lost in a Chain, Body, Philosophy and Machines. She is a member of the Art Sci Lab of Texas Dallas University Brain, NIAC, Little Sciences, Nano Robotics, AI Cognitions, LAVIX Network, Latin America Strategies for AI, Pop Philosophy, Neuro I Self. Thank you and good morning. So we are going to start to talking about decolonization. And my role here today is quite hard. I have uh, found out myself as a Brazilian Afro-Indigenous, which is not very difficult to understand if we know a little bit about the Brazilian history, but this is a very difficult concept. I did not learn that at school about my ethnicity, my family who had migrated and then had, uh, you know, my, had mixed with the slaved, slavery, black, Brazilians, as Nils Gordon says, the philosopher, he says that people who believe they have such a load, they live that permanent melancholy, which is the permanent non-belonging feeling. And I keep thinking about cultural erasing that this society was living already with the mass culture for a while. But what is taking place now with the digital culture is similar to the mass culture. And by mass culture, I mean contents which have been disseminated by TV, by marketing, by advertisement, all contents. They follow their uh, ideology, their own way of seeing the world. But with digital culture, we have another problem, which is we are not able to turn off a device. We are no longer able to turn off things as digital culture is constantly present, is pervasive. We are not able to run away from digital systems, not even when you turn off your smartphone. With that uh, thinking in mind, when we talk about biases and uh, prejudices, last year, Professor Virgilio Almeida had suggested that my group would uh, talk about uh, extremism and biases. And then I had named my group as Decolonize. And because I am considering to develop a project where I would like to learn more and how can we solve a bias issue or how can we better understand bias deeply. 
As it was read in my bio, I have an artistic vein where 10 or 20 years ago, I participated at free software movements, uh, maker spaces and records spaces, which is a culture that was somehow suffocated, but we have to become owners of the technologies and we have to change the technologies, but not only. But not only changing or modifying technologies, but rather how do we see the reasoning behind algorithms? When we talk about data colonialism and the criticism to it, we are assessing the tip of the iceberg. There is a culture which will extract as much as data as possible, and they are going to apply and use that data at different ways. And the idea to think about a colony is to think about epistemological challenges, which are many in the AI group, uh, Artificial Intelligence to Africa, where our both guests are participants at, there is another colleague who talks a lot about Ubuntu. And he says, artificial intelligence is part of epistemology, which it comes from, I think, so I exist. How about considering a different epistemology, such as Ubuntu, I am, because you are? How can an AI be a way to represent a collectivity? AI, it represents by itself a collectivity as it extracts data. However, the problem, AI has epistemological guidance and a logical stewardship where that type of intelligence is an intelligence which is discriminatory, which classifies and establishes parameters. If we want AI to be representative or multicultural, we have to understand how algorithms are being defined and how can we interfere into the algorithms. How about bias? What do we have today? Humans are biased, generative AI is even worse. We have a product which is a global north product developed, which comes from a industrial culture, which was developed throughout colonial violence, throughout uh, humans' exploitations, humans which were not considered to be humans enough to be protected according to human rights. When we think that we have a humanist culture which had justified the exploration and genocide due to an idea that some are more humans than others. And to believe in that, we do need devices that we work as different ways of prejudice. Database will show that a physician, an architect, will be related to an ethne, they are men, white, and one of the exercises that we did last year, which was a conceptual test, how could we think about a colonial a, a colonial AI, how about the future? 
Well, the future of medicine would be a physician visiting a patient. But I, I asked that in English with no gender. And then they gave me a man visiting their patients to have a cup of tea. So this is the type of the result that they give me. Very racist and with lots of prejudice. A future vision, a person looking at another one with some devices. And this is the result that they gave me. Can you see the helmets and everything else? So there is a super representation or a hyper representation of different ways of living. And those ways of living are not a representation of the whole, a representation of the imaginary. A participant said, how about the future feeding? And we could think that the future feeding, it's going to be something else, not a tablet with a Wi-Fi. Maybe that could be thought differently. And at the side, another participant that wrote, that asked the future education, a prompt with a number of information to learn about uh, AI as a point in which soon it will be creating content for entertainment or education for younger generations. And below, another participant, the future communication would be a relationship between artificial intelligence and human beings. That you can see the couple there, you know, the young lady with a robot representing AI. So the relationship of AI with a female. So these are all imaginary aspects and the impact that images may cause in our subjectivity. And there are some studies showing how Instagram may influence the way as girls uh, behave in terms of anorexia, depression, and other anxiety feelings. On the upper image to the left, we have a future city. How will cities be? in the future and people we have not only people but we have a scene which has nothing to do with our own territories and below at Canva, whose visual, visual communication platform showed people meeting at a square with lots of social inequality, with a public of mixed ethnicities. Artificial intelligence is not able yet to do it as it access database in such a way that in addition to the database, there is also a thing about how they will understand and work with the algorithms, the direction that they give it to algorithms. So the impact that those images will create in our imaginary, how can our brain or how does brain operate and how does our conscious work? The neurons, mirror neurons that are active when actor picks up the banana, for instance, that is example above. Whenever we observe an action, our neurons, they work as if we were mirroring that action. Like those hyper-violent games for children, children who are still under development, screen time, violent images, violent actions, all of that is training our brain within this type of attitude. And more recently, Nicolelis, the scientist, said that our brain is getting adapted to the binary system. 
as if it were a way to adapt to a new stage of evolution, but not quite an evolution, but a new stage, a new level where we would adapt to that binary system because that's the way as how the reasoning works now. How can we solve that problem though? Well, this panel here today has got panelists who are thinking about a possible project that can somehow change the database or that can turn around different online experiences and foster those different online experiences. The project, decolonize would try a participative methodology, a methodology bottom up, a methodology that will listen to others, a methodology that will allow a responsible data collection. And uh, I have been working with that more deep AI research for the past seven years such as the report, once machines will decide, involving players from several sectors, including art history or history of art. We are here at the University of Sao Paulo, working with people who are directly related to scientific studies, scientific learning. Therefore, the academy has to propose, how can we design a database? Reports before an algorithm is designed. How can we write down reports before each decision is made? How were the decisions made? There is a story to be told. This is a ethnography of the process as a whole. And we do need a process ethnography to talk about ethics and values. Quando, quando a gente traz, é, por exemplo, eu estou querendo trazer a bioética para a discussão... Da... I would like to take bioethics to discuss about technologies. As I believe that talking about which values are they taking to us and which values are we willing to embed it within the system and to discuss about values, we do need the processes reports. Otherwise, we won't be able to say right away, I want an explanation which is expected to have that in the law. How is that How was that image made? Well, that's quite difficult to get such an explanation because the database, they became an algorithm. They are mixed up. So to get an explanation, we would need a process report to be able where there was a bias, where there was a deviation in the pathway because that is being harmful to the society and is getting so far away from the values that would like to leverage as a society. So these are my comments today and I thank you so much for the opportunity and I am at your disposal for questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Any questions to Alan? Uh, a gente tem uma pergunta para Saida. Saida, are you there? Yes, we have a question to Saida. Yes, yes, I'm here. For you. Sim, pergunta para Saida. Uh, I will ask you. From Rafaela Venturella de Negri. Saida, I love the presentation. I would like to know your view upon using data, known bias data, in wealth redistribution, redistribution systems for economic equity. Last year, the World Bank and the IMF were call out, called out for using bias data when selecting possible candidates for wealth transfer policies in African countries. Could a new non-based data work these problems out? Uh, 
I, the short answer is yes. I think it, you, the way that this, this technology works is that it, the result is only as good as what you put in. So if you put biased data into your solution, then your solution will be biased. And so it is super important to be intentional at the beginning when you're training the machine, when you're creating the training data, to make sure that it is um, accurately reflective of um, and, and includes data that um, is reliable and complete so that it is um, the solution then meets the needs for everyone that it's meant to um, to work for. So, uh, and to answer your question, it's yes. Um, and the World Bank and, and whomever is building solutions, Amazon or anyone else, um, really going out and making sure that they have um, accurate, accurate, reliable, trustworthy, verified um, community information about the communities that they're looking to serve is critical. And without that, you will absolutely have biased um, outputs. With that, you will have better outputs. All right, thank you, Saida. One more, uh, uma pergunta mais do público. Yes, we have a question here in the front by a participant. The mic has been taken to him. My name is Halu. I'm a social scientist. I liked uh, your presentation, Ellen, very much. You have raised interesting aspects here in a long run. Superstructure, which is a cultural issue. With that in mind, I think so I exist. We have uh, all the AI biases. I exist. So I'm talking about the present, okay? Because there was a prior process that came before me, such as ethne, eth ethnical aspects, how you had evolved from the past to the present. And that is very relevant. We, for Brazil also, our activities, our actions are also considered to be in the long run. What type of actions will Brazil take and based on which cultural framework? And now my question. Language. Language is essential. You that work in the art field, that is probably very ordinary to you, but to other fields, that's not so common, so ordinary, I mean. And your experience in the United States on a specific state, which is California, in California, They have a, a very strong Latin culture where over 50% of the Californians, they would speak Spanish over there. And when we take that cultural aspect to Brazil, and if we say that the Amazon region will be a uh, very important economic and strategic region to the country, my question now, finally, in the Amazon region, where we have uh, neighbored countries such as the Dutch Guiana, the English Guiana, where there were 
all this ethnicity, which was the main one for the Tukinamba ethnic, ethnicity, which has also affected our formation. We have a thesis at our university which addresses the fights and the battles of Tupinambas, which is a people, a population that lived in the borders of the Amazon regions. And that is also related to uh, the Antilles, which is more Dutch than, you know, Brazilian. In the Amazon region, we have a strong English culture. British culture, better saying. What are the challenges to someone who is considering all those biases? How can you start from a strong culture from the Dutchess to transpose that to the British ones? I hope you got the reflection. Thank you. You have mentioned so many things in your comment and uh, slash questions. I don't know if I got everything, but I will do my best to answer what I got from your reflection. Language. Language is very important. There is a scientist. Lara Borodistic, she is a cognitive scientist who says Aboriginal language, a child who is from the Aboriginal tribe, says that when they say they are going to a place or coming from a place, they say all the position, north, cardinal, 30 degrees, you know, that is part of their language, that they have a GPS as part part of their culture. There is no need to access a GPS, but that's not part of our culture. We never had this kind of instruction or information. So when we talk about decoloniality, we are talking about uh, languages and uh, by languages, you mentioned California and why I was in California. I want to learn more about the indigenous culture. And in the USA, a child was raised within a certain ethnic, it will have in their mind a language, a dialect, which is not English. And when they go to school, they find some obstacles. And why is that? Because the language is embedded to the culture. The way as they see the world is not just an immediate communication. It's not just a tool of communication. So representativity is a problem, is an issue. And equity is not just a matter to say, I oh, poor you, because uh, we don't want to under evaluate an indigenous child because they are not, they are not able to learn something but rather because of that knowledge has to get adapted to that uh, subject, to that individual. And when we talk about a pervasive digital system and AI, we have to make those systems to create that feeling of belonging and of understanding within that space. And how can we make that system to become a multicultural one? And this is the main challenge that I see for AI and the whole digital system. So thank you. No temos mais perguntas. Passamos para o Femi Omer. Now, shall we give the floor to Femi Omer? But before that, if you have any additional questions, you may say your email to e IEA respond. So he is a Nigerian and British citizen. He's got a law degree in London and he's still a member of the Garden. 
chambers. He moved to Tanzania in 2008, and ever since, he's doing a great and exclusive and unique job in the regions. He's got lots of experience in the legal areas, such as data protection, environmental management, and sustainability, rights and involvement within the local communities, trying to reduce the gap between international communities and best practices for human rights. He is acknowledged as international legal expertise. Expert. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, no, no problem at all. Thank you so much. And uh, really wonderful to be here and be part of this conversation. And there's been, you know, such a rich array of thoughts and ideas already. And just picking up one thing that uh, Ellen said about how do we create a more welcoming, um, if you like, digital space. And I, I, I immediately kind of grasped, clasped on that um, idea and um, wh why, why, why do we need that and um, what was the big issue? Um, and the big issue oftentimes is that when we're looking at our kind of modern uh, environment, uh, of course, from our various perspectives and our different positions across the globe, you're in Brazil right here, I'm, I'm in Tanzania, uh, Ellen, uh, um, should I say, Said is in the US. All at once, we 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 form around um, interconnected ideas, but um, within a, a kind of dominant space that has seems overly dominant when one actually looks at the the reality of it of its dominance. Now, the dominant force that we're living under is, you know, at best four or five hundred years old, and so when we kind of wrap that up within the perspective of you know humanity forget about gaia and how old gaia is 3.2 billion years old but even in in terms of of humanity 500 years isn't that much it's actually quite infant and i think that issue of of infancy is actually important here because some of our narratives that we continue to hear and and it continues to define spaces like for example development underdeveloped countries developed countries and so on and so forth um, and being on the continent and seeing the rich array of yes of course within the midst of some chaos chaos brought about by you know many years of, of extraction and, and 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 we know the story we know the narratives i won't repeat it necessarily but even within that context you you have such a rich abundance that's you know, within the ground, within the peoples that are uh, around. And that doesn't mean, as I said, it's not romanticizing it. It's saying that these structures, these intelligences are seeping through our soil, around us. They are part of a, a kind of universality that is still in existence, notwithstanding, if you like, the, the destruction. Um, and that's, that's also important because that kind of fractal, of, of life, that fractal of, of, of humanity is part and parcel of our origins. And that origin space of humanity starts where? It's on the continent of Africa. And we too often forget that as though it's some form of, you know, yesteryear. The whole issue of progress and what that actually means in, as I said, that kind of four or 500 year perspective is an engineered outlook of what it is to be human. For many, many more thousands of years, we've lived in much more circular environments. That, that idea that things decay and reform. And yet now we just have this issue that progress going forward, going forward is the be all that linear progress that that forms our humanity. And yet nothing in the cosmos represents that idea and yet that forms you know this this so-called developed idea of humanity and so that issue of infancy is quite important because sometimes you know when you have the, you know younger children can sometimes be very very you know focused in one way they they see it that way and until they kind of grow up and see things in a much more rounded manner and and i see um this dominant force that we're living in somehow um, infant in that kind of way and there's um, this idea of we, we, we've somehow forgotten where we've come from at that most cellular kind of point and as you've all already said um, that will seep into whatever it is we make 
whatever he do. And that's not to say, and, and this is really important, that's not to say that everything that is built with that in mind is negative. That would be a rather stymied way of looking at um, how things evolve over time. That is not the, the, the question. But the question is, in lots of ways, is that we, we live in this a very skewed um, world where the dominant narrative uh, takes over. And, and so the idea of whether you see it as a fight or whether it, you see it as a challenge or whether it is just as we've used the term, a regenerative process whereby we look to get back to a different reality. And that's not simply saying that that is only in places like Africa, only in places in Asia or South America and so on. That's happening around the globe. There are touch points everywhere. So that universality around, if you like, Ubuntuism, that kind of Cosmo Ubuntu, as one of our colleagues puts it, whereby we, we look to the norms. And this is the thing. How do we kind of renormalize normality? Again, <laughs> quoting a, a phrase by one of our senior colleagues. And how do we get back to an origin that not only serves the purpose of uh, regenerating um, realities from within the continent and the diaspora, but which actually is a universal force that seeps around the globe. And that's what I think is the challenge for our next age. And in some senses, AI, AI, and I think that term is very instructive, AI that's dominating our headlines day in, day out, starts with what word? Artificial. Artificial. That's for me, this is problematic. Why is something that is going to be so important in our kind of global narrative of who we become as human? Why should that be an artificial force? I have a big problem with that term. And so in, 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 in lots of our thoughts, and, and this isn't, it, it may be a, a phrase that I've thought about, but it's conversations. These are conversations that we've been having for years and looking at, well, what, what alternative how would we phrase it to somehow be more representative of what we actually want to inculcate within our technologies? How do we want to use our data? And data, as, as Saida said, is everywhere. It's everything. It's not just technology. Uh, what about something that's more complementary? Something that complements the human spirit as opposed to something that is artificial. So our starting point and the words we use and what they resonate have power, have meaning. I'm a lawyer and I know that a comma can change the whole meaning of a whole clause. So we shouldn't take it lightly to continue to prism this so-called powerful, powerful force as an artificial force when we know that we are part and parcel of the creation of that thing in the first place. So to go back to what Saida said about being intentional, why not be intentional about creating a force that complements the best of who, who humanity is, as opposed to just throwing everything in there as a you know, kind of weird blamange and let's see what comes out of it. Let's be intentional. Let's stop war. Let's create abundance. Let's redistribute in a way that makes sense. You know, you can start to now um, leverage technology and going back to the algorithm and how that's built is because absolutely it's essential. So how do we do that at the moment? Because we can go into all these big ideas. And one of the biggest things that have happened to us all, and we have all, and I say all, all that, all those who to a large extent have been or have had access to the internet and a kind of modern technology and so on, in inverted commas, modern. The big issue has been that our data dividend has been sucked up and continues to be sucked up. That is what happens on a daily basis. We use all the social media out there as though it's just something to augment our lives. When we know there are huge tech giants out there enjoying that data and become very, very powerful and 
adding to that kind of dislocation. How can we move from that? Is it possible to move from that? Is, it, is there any advantage of moving from that? Could those forces actually, um, if changed in direction, um, become more positive? So there's lots of questions and it's not an, um, a black or white as far as I can see, pardon the pun. Yeah, it's not a black and white scenario. We don't know how these uh, um, uh, forces will become in the future, but we do know how certain things have behaved in the past. So we can look to that to say, if there hasn't been a major shift, should we expect different outcomes? So moving to the practical, if I may, and thinking about just day-to-day -day things, and this is not a panacea to create something that's ultimately better. It's about creating starting points, everyday starting points. You know, what do we use to process our work? We use, and I'm not bashing here, I'm just saying it how it is. We use Google Workspace, we use Office 365 as though it's just helping us. But we know how wealthy those companies are. So we have to start asking ourselves, well, hold on a minute. The ability for those companies to be so wealthy is, ba is based on what? It's based on our data. That's, that's, the, that's the basics. We're going to break it down to its basics. That's what it's about. So why are we not in this game? Why haven't we built structures in Brazil, in Tanzania, in, you know, parts of the community within the U.S., whereby we're now hosting our own data. This becomes important, and it doesn't mean there's no deal to be done. So I'm not saying, it, you know, what you do with your data is your business, but at least only in the first instance. Have it to be able to exchange, but we don't have that scenario in the main. LinkedIn, I'm going to call out a few, I'm afraid. I mean, they may not like it, but it is what it is. But we know the, 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 the usual suspects, and we're all on them, by the way. We're all complicit to this. So at some stage, we've got to take the hit and say, do we want to own our own data so that we can actually start having this conversation about decoloniality in the context of something that we can do about it? Because at the moment, every th like for example, we're recording this session, it's going into a, into a, a server. Somebody's going to crunch all this conversation. Before th that strategy that you had to decolonize is now being <laughs> taken apart and the antidote has been put to reiterate a system that's actually stronger than the way you're thinking in the first place. That, I would suggest, are some of the thought processes that we need to go through, as painful as it is. We need to do it. And so what have we done just to start this process so that we move it on to something a bit more lighter and practical? Um, we, we said to ourselves, you know what? Yes, people think we're nuts. How on earth are you going to take on these big giants? And by the way, we're not taking on anybody. That is the point sometimes as well. We, I believe, ought to start framing things in the way we want them to be in and of themselves, as opposed to juxtaposing or setting them against something that has been. So creating a platform, the higher network, and I'll, if I may just uh, share my screen at this stage. We're not telling people, you know, this is uh, the new LinkedIn or whatever. Some people say that to us. We're not, we're just creating a space that is modeled in a way and we've invited people um, and we're not saying only certain people can come this is a very open platform but you know it's an african home it's an african homestead it's a diasporan homestead but everybody is welcome and we're saying that we need to start doing these things and we need to start having our own service and we need to start being able to replicate these systems in a federated way, using open source technology and so on. Because that technology is out, that is out there, that um, you know, is so dominant, that we also, and I say we, the world has contributed towards. It seem, seems as though this is a Silicon Valley kind of uh, 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 development. But if, when you go into the nuts and bolts of who built these systems, we're a part of it as well. And you could say, well, we're part to blame as well, but we don't control it. But we're part 
of building these structures and the technologies behind them. So why not use them and, and repurpose them and create different forms in parallel? And then start breaking that down and, and building up again from the bottom up because that's how it works best. Uh, you know, maybe against the grain, but that's how it works best. Start rebuilding and, and not just rebranding, rebuilding technologies that kind of built in our image and likeness, to use that phrase. And so, for example, we, we've created this, this space, the higher network. It will be familiar in terms of its form, looking a bit like, you know, one of those big tech companies or what have you. But the narratives inside them, uh, the people inside them, the ideas that are flowing, I would suggest flows from that center point of a global African narrative, which in and of itself, by that definition, is, is, is global. We self-host, so this is our data. It's not going to some, to some other place where they can crunch it and then come up with some smart algorithm to make us do what they want us to do. So we've got to start thinking, well, hold on. We need to be the algorithm to our platforms. It can be done. Um, you know, let me just quickly go into a few aspects of this. So this is like a social media um, hub. And, and we've got people from all over the around, all over the world here. And, um, you know, it's still in beta form in, in some respects. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem. You're not going to run and, and jump to get money immediately when you're trying to form something that is really representative of the idea some, that we're talking about. You run too fast, mm, it doesn't happen. So we need to build slowly and organically. And decolonize AI is here, as you see. They have a group as well. And within that group, they, you know, you can do the familiar things that we know or we, we've become accustomed to. But we're saying we're doing it in within a different environment and we're not going to replicate that type of thing. And what's important, because this has been um, spoken to us a, a number of times, well, are you not just trying to replicate and become a big Google down the road? And we said, well, that's not our model because what we want to demonstrate is that A, it can be done and you will not be disappointed with what's been built. You know, you can do your live chats, you can have your discussion forums, your documents, all the things that we do on the, those platforms where they enjoy our data and make use of it. We're saying we're going to do this on our uh, servers, but there are going to be organizations who want to do this too, and they should be able to. And we will assist that process. As I said, we're developing um, um, federated systems, built on open source. We don't own this. We're, we're leveraging the technology. And in fact, that's how most of those big tech companies are anyway. So we're saying, let's, let's roll this out to our communities where we can actually be much more empowered with some of the tools that are out there. It's not all doom and gloom. There is life either after or beside big tech. They're important. We can't deny that. They're in such a pivotal position. But it's not the end of the story. And we go further than that because these are like, you know, kind of social media. But what about your day to day, like, you know, uh, productivity stuff? Uh, you know, I've been using and I'm not going to deny this. I used Office 365 throughout most of my career or the, the earlier iteratives of, of that product. It's fine. And, and it's great. I'm not going to diss it. It's, it's a good product. That's why it did so well. But again, that whole issue of well, whose data is this uh, becomes quite important. And so, you know, we wanted to find something that we could say, well, hold on a minute. Um, what about uh, scenarios where I don't want my uh, data to be, you know, sat on Microsoft servers? How do we do that? Uh, you self-host. Is that rocket science? It's not. We're doing it here. All of this stuff here, you know, documentation, calendars, uh, you know, uh, video conferencing, all of that stuff is done from our own servers. And we want to assist communities, big and small, corporations, large and small, to get on this bandwagon. It's superly important. And let me just, maybe I say this and then and I'll wrap up, just to give that kind of economic side to it as well, because this sometimes, when you talk money, people think their ears prick up. And Reddit, who I think most of us have heard of previously, earlier this year did an IPO. And, you know, that was headlines. But the other headline, which was probably hidden away in the text of it, was that Google were going, had offered them $60 million per annum to use their platform's data to train their AI. 
I don't know if they went into the deal or not. I think they did. They may have done. That's their decision. But what's the real point about that? The real point about that is that it's valuable data that we give away each and every day for zero. That needs to stop. I think of a university like the University of Sao Paulo and, and, and all the universities in Africa that I know on these so-called free platforms. They would want your data anyway. Self-host, start owning your data. Let's bring the decoloniality subject within the context of where we can actually do something. I think at the moment what happens is it feels as though we are going to have this very expensive and rich dialogue, but we will not have the apparatus to actually do anything about it. So don't want to doom and gloom here, but I do want to uh, be very clear that there are plenty of technologies out there for us to, to, to leverage, to at least start to chip away and create different realities, different narratives, different stories. And I'll just leave it there for now if there are any questions. Thank you, Femi. Perguntas? Questions, não? Hi, Femi, thank you. Um, I think you said uh, some important points. One is uh, when you talk about the artificial, uh, this is another thing that we, we have in this tradition. Um, when we think, uh, I think, therefore, I am, it's, it's, um, it's centered in one individual. And when we think about I am because you are, you, we are thinking about general. So this, uh, this artificiality is created um, because um, the separation now, mm. the Cartesian, you know, this, I think therefore I am, the Cartesian uh, thought also thinks uh, mind is separate from the body. And, uh, and uh, mind is separate from the soul. So intelligence is already mm. artificial. That is Alan Turing was saying, because in intelligence is already artificial, because intelligence is already what we have in the algorithm is, you know, you identify, mm. you classify, you. So this is from the culture. Mm. So and consciousness is is a different thing. Consciousness is it's is more about your soul, how you perceive things. So maybe what we have here, I think, when you you think about this counter hegemonic uh, action which is we need to have our platforms we need to collect our data we need to own our data but we also need to to see how this data will be organized and shared so it's good that it need to be open source probably and when saida have this project, for example, um, I want to hear the narratives of people. I want to hear the narratives of elder because this digital world people are are like uh, mm. are like uh, missing, you know, this um, wisdom, this wisdom from experience, from our heritage and everything. So I think these are actions we are thinking of. So, but one thing, I, a question I have for you, and when people ask me, say, okay, let's join Hosted in Africa. And, and people say, and then I think, okay, you have a cloud. Your, the cloud of Hosted in Africa is in Germany. And the, 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 the format is also, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, no, no, no. if we want yeah. to be counter hegemonic, the first thing is to understand we don't have the infrastructures, but we can give more plur plurality and in kind of spread instead of 
living all our data just with Google, just with Amazon. Exactly. Just we can kind of spread through other places which are still in the north because they you know the the infrastructure are are still not just in the north but in the asia but i you know you too may may know this better but um yeah so i, I i'm going to ask you too now how you are thinking of uh putting the decolon decolonizing thought into those structures which are uh, built by this thought, do you know what, mm. what I mean? It's yeah, like no, I do, I do. I, 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 yeah, it's really so important. How, yeah. yeah, how you, you two are thinking about the transition and how mm. you two are thinking, for example, ask an elder, how this is going to be, how you think this can impact mm. and change and also hosted in Africa, how you think I, I, you already said yes. We need to own our data. So I understand you. you this is your uh, ar argument. But uh, how can we make it different? And maybe we need a transition. Absolutely. I think one of the things I said um, was that these are parallel systems. As we ourselves start to, if you like, deconstruct and reconstruct, you know, you, you need to start from somewhere, and. The other thing about what I said is that there is this temptation sometimes. It's a bit like, you know, America, you know, side is in America now and, and we see this, you know, the, you know the, the, the leader of the world and all, all that's been built there. But of course, when you go into the history, who built the damn place, you know, who really built the place? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So you, one has to be careful about kind of detaching our uh, rightful place to to using the technology that exists. The point is, who owns the unit? Who owns the technology, and what are they doing with it? And I think that's what's important. Our way in which, and and of course, you, one can only take my word for it. Maybe you say in twenty years' time, I'm exactly how they were. But you know, then I I let myself down and everything I stand for. Now, what I'm saying is that. Technology is evolving all the time and it, it needs to evolve again. At, at this moment in time, we don't have a footprint enough in terms of being able to change how that algorithm will work. Because we don't have the data, we don't have the, those large language models that these guys have been working on for 40 years. Sorry to say it like as them and us, because it's not, that's, it's way more complicated than that. My point is that, you know, Brazil, you know, countries within Africa, India, we've got huge populations. And if we change, if we start to engineer that change, and I use that word purposely, engineer that change, in 10 years' time, we're, we're having a different conversation. We're having a very different conversation. The infrastructure that you talk about, uh, and this is important about, you know, you know, servers, wherever they may be, because even those big players, there's their things are distributed all over the world. It's how you control your server that's ultimately important. How do you control it? Can people get to my data? You know, is it encrypted end to end? So even okay, you get hold of it, and then what? I just move it on to another one. So again, it's these types of ideas, not getting too caught up necessarily in where things are, but how are you dealing with your data? How are you dealing with the infrastructure? How are you setting up your your uh, your, your database? How are you um, setting up your, your, your structures? I think that becomes critically important as well. As we start to see, and it is happening within the continent, it's, you know, infrastructure is starting to be built. People are starting to understand companies, you know, indigenous companies saying, well, we need to own our own data here. How can we just give away everything we, we, you know, all our university data? Can you imagine that your top minds in inverted commas in the country, all your work, the medium of instruction is on Google. How, how did that happen? Who made that decision? And I know, so I don't want to be overly critical here because I've done it most of my life, but that's the point. It was almost as though we just got startled by the technology without thinking deeply enough as to what that would mean 20, 30 years down the line. We have an opportunity in places like the continent of Africa where, you know, populations are growing like that, where the access to the internet is growing like that. It can be a different narrative, but we've got to get this idea into government, into companies and into, you know, just everyday people. 
You know, the, the lights are shining on that phone. It looks great. But what is it doing on the underbelly? Can we do anything about that? Yes, we can. And that's the point. Yes, we can. Thank you, Femi. Saida, please. Would you like to? Yeah, I, I think I would just um, add to to the point, just the 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 practical need to be aware of and always thinking about um, the importance of training data. Um, not only the creation of it, like with programs like Ask an Elder um, and others, but also the transparency of it. So I think it's just as important for us to now, as we interact with all kinds of large language models and other sort of machines that are being powered by data, because ask, well, what data are we talking about and, and, and where's the data coming from? And um, I find it to be um, very disturbing that it's really hard to find um, lists of sources that actually are the core training corpus for a lot of the large language models. Um, I think they should be easier to find. I think they should be published. And that's not the case. So I think there's a whole other conversation that needs to be happening around just transparency as it relates to training data that's currently informing these machines, um, which is a little bit different. But then there's also the how do we create the data, make sure that we are gathering the right data, that we're being inclusive about building proactively training data sets that can be um, integrated into current systems um, as well. So I think it's both of those pieces are practical needs right now as we interact with um, current systems and think about building new systems. And, and I wanted to add a point on the reference to Ubuntu, because I think that's, you know, we, we almost take it for granted, <laughs> like Said and I, because of kind of where we're working and stuff. That's our center point in lots of ways. But uh, the actualization of, of Ubuntuism, where, as I said, not to see it as a challenge to, you know, the Cartesian model, but to say this is a an interpretation, and we would suggest um, a more wholesome interpretation of, of humanity at, it, at its best. And if that is a proposition that um, is, is widely accepted, and I think when you talk to people, because people, you know, around the world, this, this concept exists. And that's why I loved when Jose Costa came with the phrase, you know, Cosmo Ubuntu. He's not saying this is an African concept. He's saying this is a concept of humanity at its best. And it posits everywhere around the globe. You can find it in South America. You can find it in Europe. You can find it in New Zealand. You, you can. So... And it comes from a source and being who, who we were as, as in, if, you like, if you like, the origins of, of humanity, then of course you find it there in its abundance. And, and that's very clear across the continent. So bu building you know, businesses that actualize Ubuntu becomes important. You know, not, so it's not just what we're doing, it's how we're doing it, how we interact. What's our business model? Are we having stakeholdership or we, is it just the normal shareholder profit motive? You know, these kind of conversations is what we're having. This is what we're building. So that the end product, what comes out of it at the end, I suggest it, like you say, garbage in, garbage out. Um, we would prefer to say that, you know, this methodology will have something more wholesome at its origin, at its that moment of inception where we speak, eat, breathe that way of being. And, you know, and it's difficult, it's not easy. Of course it's not easy. Uh, you know, there's ways to propel this much quicker than we're doing it. I know that from the work I've done over the, the last 20, 30 years. But building in this kind of slow, methodical way where we invite, we inculcate, we bring people on board, we share. Even the whole building of this platform, it's been, it's been member-led had a South African developer on the site this morning, you know, building something. We share. We do stuff like that. 
And, and that becomes really important to what we're really ultimately trying to build outward. And as I said, and I want to make this point again, the what we're doing is part of a fractal. Let me put it that way. This needs to be replicated. This doesn't need to be a dominant force that it pervades around the whole world. You know, we're, we're going to set up schools, we're we'll set up in a local government using these types of systems. They'll have it on board, in place, with that same type of methodology. Changes can happen. Can. Thank you, Femi. Alguém tem mais alguma questão? Are there any other comments or questions? So we are about to close. But first, I'd like to ask uh, Femi and Saida if you have any final remarks, closing remarks. Thank you for your presence and participation. Femi, Omeri, and Saida Carter, and those who have joined us uh, on site and remotely this afternoon, we are going to have another panel. And my final comment, uh, my closing remark is, I believe that we are stepping ahead to discuss upon artificial intelligence and uh, the coloniality since I started starting uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence five, seven years ago. I was already studying technology and working with technology projects for a while but I started uh, studying AI more deeply seven years ago. In the past, I acknowledge and recognize that people in the acad academy in the UK, in the USA, people would question if uh, AI ethics should be part of the debate or not, because AI was seen as being somewhat more technical. But today, over here in our chair, our focus here is to think about regulatory aspects. How can we think about this ethics with a name? A number of uh, Brazilian jurists talking about uh, human sciences and more thinking about a reflective thing, how the imaginary will impact the subjectiveness and all the type of care that we have to look after. We are somehow changing as a small stone that drops in the water and that will reverberate and you know expand that circle. I guess that now we are able to take to that debate a more subjective approach and how those technologies will interfere in our life. The, we are not able to run away from digital technologies. They are pervasive, different from others. If that is printed on a book, you don't open the book because you don't want to read that. If it's on TV, you don't turn on the TV or you don't change channels if you don't want to see it, if you don't want to watch it. But over here, that's not possible because of those parameters. They are affecting our lives. I thank you all for the opportunity. This is a very important discussion. I'm grateful for having this opportunity at uh, the University of Sao Paulo and Professor Virgilio, who is in charge of our chair here. And uh, for the opportunity to think about innovative initiatives to generate uh, multiculturalism and belonging to the digital mm. environment by several groups. So thank you, my closing remarks. And now I give the floor back to you, Femi and Saida, for your closing words. Thank you. 
Tyler, are you going or shall I go and get, let you close? <laughs> um yes please you you carry on yeah no no so first and foremost thank you to ellen and colleagues and really grateful and honored to to be part of this conversation and we hope that um um regardless of where it's hosted and all the rest it's, it's widely viewed and, and so on it's important that them um, we, we and that's the thing it's not to be um unpractical about how we get messages across we know where our people are across the world and we're, we're in these technologies so we, we've got to reach out and get to them and that's important as well so i i definitely acknowledge that and at the same time <clears throat> yeah we're at that kind of point um, and it's not just it's just happened and um, people i think have have kind of felt a little uneasy about stuff for many a year but you know there's an algorithm at work as well and we we've got to acknowledge that that it, it kind of draws us in it's you know the, the whole digital mobile world was designed in that way and that's well documented now so we're working against that force as well so we, we've got to deal with that and understand that and have mechanisms of being able to um <clears throat> come into the real world <laughs> you know what i mean we've got to have we've got to have technologies that uh, help us to connect not not disconnect and and we've talked about dislocation a lot and and that's part of if you like the fall of humanity our dislocation from you know the cosmos and, and how do we kind of reverse that process so without getting too metaphysical about it i think it's important that we 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 approach this world that we're in um we use the, the the tools that we have to at least chip away at what has become you know a, a dominant dominant force over you know some hundreds of years with different you know iterations of 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 technology um and it's acknowledging that and not being overly political about it it is what it is then what do we do and when we do it do we do it always with the attachment to that or do we create a new reality i just dropped that because sometimes i believe we have to just be and not attach it to something that we want to defeat let's bring our reality into existence Thank you, Femi. Um, I, I gather that we are um, making closing comments. Unfortunately, I, my translation wasn't on for that final um, provocation, Ellen, but um, I do just want to, in closing remarks, just kind of highlight the importance of um, collaboration, community of practice, collective action, um, the fact that this is a conversation that you know we're all having here today and there are other organizations out there that are having similar kinds of conversations and working on um, tools and policy and just thought leadership as it relates to the um, the development of um, artificial intelligence or our collective human intelligence and how it's applied to the development of better futures. That is a conversation that um, many humans are having around the world. And as much as we can connect those dots, um, as we can uh, find ways to collaborate and co-create the together um we have we collectively in the spirit of ubuntu um global north global south just earth based humans have a much better chance of building the technology um, of the future that we know we need and that our children need and that um our planet needs thank you saida Thank you, everyone, and we are closing our morning event. Thank you for your participation at the panel. I'm sorry, Saida, that you didn't get the last part, but I was translating maybe something with your device. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you, Femi. Thank you, Saida. Thank you.